Western Europe, Chapters 11 and 12, of Memoirs of a Revolutionist, Volume 2, by Peter Kropotkin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Eelin. We settled once more in Thonon, taking lodgings with our former hostess, Madame Sanso, A brother of my wife, who was dying of consumption and had come to Switzerland, joined us. I never saw such numbers of Russian spies as during the two months that I remained at Thonon. To begin with, as soon as we had engaged lodgings, a suspicious character who gave himself out for an Englishman took the other part of the house. Flocks, literally flocks of Russian spies besieged the house, seeking admission under all possible pretexts, or simply tramping in pairs, trios, and quartets in front of the house. I can imagine what wonderful reports they wrote. A spy must report. If he should merely say that he has stood for a week in the street without noticing anything mysterious, he would soon be put on the half-pay list or dismissed. It was then the golden age of the Russian secret police. Ignatieff's policy had borne fruit. There were two or three bodies of police competing with one another, each having any amount of money at their disposal, and carrying on the boldest intrigues. Colonel Sudeikin, for instance, chief of one of the branches, plotting with a certain Degayev, who, after all, killed him, denounced Ignatieff's agents to the revolutionists, and offered to the terrorists all facilities for killing the Minister of the Interior, Count Tolstoy, and the Grand Duke Vladimir, adding that he himself would then be nominated Minister of the Interior, with dictatorial powers, and the Tsar would be entirely in his hands. This activity of the Russian police culminated, later on, in the kidnapping of the Prince of Battenberg from Bulgaria. The French police, also, were on the alert. The question, what is he doing at Thonon, worried them. I continued to edit Le Revolt, and wrote articles for the Encyclopaedia Britannica and the Newcastle Chronicle. But what reports could be made out of that? One day, the local gendarme paid a visit to my landlady. He had heard from the street the rattling of some machine, and wished to report that I had in the house a secret printing press. So he came in my absence and asked the landlady to show him the press. She replied that there was none, and suggested that perhaps the gendarme had overheard the noise of her sewing machine. But he would not be convinced by so prosaic an explanation, and actually compelled the landlady to use the machine, while he listened inside the house and outside, to make sure that the rattling he had heard was the same. "'What is he doing all day?' he asked the landlady. "'He writes. He cannot write all day long. He saws wood in the garden at midday, and he takes walks every afternoon between four and five. It was November. "'Ah, that's it. When the dusk is coming on. À la tombe de la nuit.' and he wrote in his notebook, never goes out except at dusk. I could not well explain at that time this special attention of the Russian spies, but it must have had some connection with the following. When Ignatieff was nominated prime minister, advised by the ex-prefect of Paris, Andrieux, he hit on a new plan. He sent a swarm of his agents into Switzerland, and one of them undertook the publication of a paper which slightly advocated the extension of provincial self-government in Russia, but whose chief purpose was to combat the revolutionists and to rally to its standard those of the refugees who did not sympathize with terrorism. This was certainly a means of sowing division. Then, when nearly all the members of the executive committee had been arrested in Russia, and a couple of them had taken refuge at Paris, Ignatieff sent an agent to Paris to offer an armistice. He promised that there should be no further executions on account of the plots during the reign of Alexander II, even if those who had escaped arrest fell into the hands of the government, that Chernyshevsky should be released from Siberia, and that a commission should be nominated to revise the cases of all those who had been exiled to Siberia without trial. He asked the executive committee to promise to make no attempts against the Tsar's life until his coronation was over. Perhaps the reforms in favor of the peasants, which Alexander III intended to make, were also mentioned. 
The agreement was made at Paris and was kept on both sides. The terrorists suspended hostilities. Nobody was executed for complicity in the former conspiracies. Those who were arrested later on under this indictment were immured in the Russian Bastille at Schlüsselburg, where nothing was heard of them for fifteen years, and where most of them still are. Chernyshevsky was brought back from Siberia and ordered to stay at Astrakhan, where he was severed from all connection with the intellectual world of Russia and soon died. A commission went through Siberia, releasing some of the exiles, and specifying terms of exile for the reminder. My brother Alexander received from it an additional five years. While I was at London, in 1882, I was also told one day that a man who pretended to be a bona fide agent of the Russian government, and could prove it, wanted to enter into negotiations with me. Tell him that if he comes to my house I will throw him down the staircase, was my reply. The consequence of it was, I suppose, that while Ignatiev considered the Tsar guaranteed from the attacks of the executive committee, he thought that the anarchists might make some attempt, and wanted therefore to have me out of the way. Chapter 12 the anarchist movement had taken a considerable development in France during the years 1881 and 1882. It was generally believed that the French mind was hostile to communism, and within the International Working Men's Association, collectivism was preached instead. Collectivism meant, then, the possession of the instruments of production in common, each separate group having, however, to settle for itself whether the consumption of produce should be on individualistic or communistic lines. In reality, the French mind was hostile only to the monastic communism, to the phalanstère of the old schools. When the Jura Federation, at its Congress of 1880, boldly declared itself anarchist communist, that is, in favor of free communism, anarchism won wide sympathy in France. Our paper began to spread in that country, Letters were exchanged in great numbers with French workers, and an anarchist movement of importance rapidly developed at Paris and in some of the provinces, especially in the Lyon region. When I crossed France in 1881, on my way from Thonon to London, I visited Lyon, Saint-Étienne, and Vienne, lecturing there, and I found in these cities a considerable number of workers ready to accept our ideas. By the end of 1882, a terrible crisis prevailed in the Lyon region. The silk industry was paralyzed, and the misery among the weavers so great that crowds of children stood every morning at the gates of the barracks, where the soldiers gave away what they could spare of their bread and soup. This was the beginning of the popularity of General Boulanger, who had permitted this distribution of food. The miners of the region were also in a very precarious state. I knew that there was a great deal of fermentation, but during the eleven months I had stayed at London I had lost close contact with the French movement. A few weeks after I returned to Thonon, I learned from the papers that the miners of monceau le mine incensed at the vexations of the ultra-Catholic owners of the mines, had begun a sort of movement. They were holding secret meetings, talking of a general strike. The stone crosses erected on all the roads round the mines were thrown down or blown up by dynamite cartridges, which are largely used by the miners in underground work, and often remain in their possession. The agitation at Lyon also took a more violent character. The anarchists, who were rather numerous in the city, allowed no meeting of the opportunist politicians to be held without obtaining a hearing for themselves, storming the platform as a last resource. They brought forward resolutions to the effect that the mines and all necessaries for production, as well as the dwelling-houses, ought to be owned by the nation, and these resolutions were carried with enthusiasm to the horror of the middle classes. The feeling among the workers was growing every day against the opportunist town councillors and political leaders, as also against the press, who made light of a very acute crisis, and undertook nothing to relieve the widespread misery. As is usual at such times, the fury of the poorer people turned especially against the places of amusement and debauch, 
which became only the more conspicuous in times of desolation and misery, as they impersonate for the worker the egotism and dissoluteness of the wealthier classes. A place particularly hated by the workers was the underground café at the Théâtre Bellecourt, which remained open all night, and where, in the small hours of the morning, one could see newspaper men and politicians feasting and drinking in company with gay women. Not a meeting was held, but some menacing allusion was made to that café, and one night a dynamite cartridge was exploded in it by an unknown hand. A socialist working man, who was occasionally there, jumped to blow out the lighted fuse of the cartridge and was killed, while a few of the feasting politicians were slightly wounded. Next day, a dynamite cartridge was exploded at the doors of a recruiting bureau, and it was said that the anarchists intended to blow up the huge statue of the Virgin which stands on one of the hills of Lyon. One must have lived at Lyon, or in its neighborhood, to realize the extent to which the population and the schools are still in the hands of the Catholic clergy, and to understand the hatred that the male portion of the population feel toward the clergy. A panic now sees the wealthier classes of Lyon. Some sixty anarchists, all workers, and only one middle-class man, Émile Gautier, who was on a lecturing tour in the region, were arrested. The Lyon papers undertook at the same time to incite the government to arrest me, representing me as the leader of the agitation who had come from England in order to direct the movement. Russian spies began to parade again in conspicuous numbers in our small town. Almost every day I received letters, evidently written by spies of the international police, mentioning some dynamite plot, or mysteriously announcing that consignments of dynamite had been shipped to me. I made quite a collection of these letters, writing on each of them Police Internationale, and they were taken away by the police when they made a search in my house. But they did not dare to produce these letters in court, nor did they ever restore them to me. In December, the house where I stayed was searched in Russian fashion, and my wife, who was going to Geneva, was arrested at the station in Thonon and also searched. But, of course, nothing was found to compromise me or anyone else. Ten days passed, during which I was quite free to go away, if I had wished to do so. I received several letters advising me to disappear, one of them from an unknown Russian friend, perhaps a member of the diplomatic staff, who seemed to have known me, and who wrote that I must leave at once, because otherwise I should be the first victim of an extradition treaty which was about to be concluded between France and Russia. I remained where I was, and when the Times inserted a telegram saying that I had disappeared from Thonon, I wrote a letter to the paper giving my address, and declaring that since so many of my friends were arrested, I had no intention of leaving. In the night of December 21st, my brother-in-law died in my arms. We knew that his illness was incurable, but to see a young life extinguished in your presence, after a brave struggle against death, is terrible. We were both quite broken down. Three or four hours later, as the dull winter morning was dawning, Gendarme came to the house to arrest me. Seeing in what a state my wife was, I asked to remain with her till the burial was over, promising upon my word of honour to be at the prison door at a given hour. But this was refused, and the same night I was taken to Lyon. Elisir Reclus, notified by telegraph, came at once, bestowing on my wife all the gentleness of his great heart. Friends came from Geneva, and although the funeral was an absolutely civil one, which was a novelty in that little town, half of the population was at the burial, to show my wife that the hearts of the poorer classes and the simple Savoy peasants were with us, and not with their rulers. When my trial was going on, the peasants followed it with sympathy, and used to come every day from the mountain villages to town to get the papers. Another incident which profoundly touched me was the arrival at Lyon of an English friend. He came on behalf of a gentleman well known and esteemed in the English political world, in whose family I had spent many happy hours at London in 1882. He was the bearer of a considerable sum of money for the purpose of obtaining my release on bail, 
and he transmitted me at the same time the message of my London friend that I need not care in the least about the bail, but must leave France immediately. In some mysterious way he managed to see me freely, not in the double-grated iron cage, in which I was allowed interviews with my wife, and he was as much affected by my refusal to accept the offer he came to make as I was by this touching token of friendship on the part of one who, with his wonderfully excellent wife, I had already learnt to esteem so highly. The French government wanted to have one of those great trials which produce an impression upon the population, but there was no possibility of prosecuting the arrested anarchists for the explosions. It would have required bringing us before a jury, which in all probability would have acquitted us. Consequently, the government adopted the Machiavellian course of prosecuting us for having belonged to the International Workingmen's Association. There is in France a law, passed immediately after the fall of the Commune, under which men can be brought before a simple police court for having belonged to that association. The maximum penalty is five years' imprisonment, and a police court is always sure to pronounce the sentences which are wanted by the government. The trial began at Lyon in the first days of January 1883, and lasted about a fortnight. The accusation was ridiculous, as everyone knew that none of the Lyon workers had ever joined the International, and it entirely fell through, as may be seen from the following episode. The only witness for the prosecution was the chief of the secret police at Lyon, an elderly man who was treated at the court with the utmost respect. His report, I must say, was quite correct as concerns the facts. The anarchists, he said, had taken hold of the population. They had rendered opportunist meetings impossible because they spoke at each such meeting, preaching communism and anarchism and carrying with them the audience. Seeing that so far he had been fair in his testimony, I ventured to ask him a question. Did you ever hear the name of the International Workingmen's Association spoken of at Lyon? Never, he replied sulkily. When I returned from the London Congress of 1881, and did all I could to have the International reconstituted in France, did I succeed? No, they did not find it revolutionary enough. Thank you, I said, and turning toward the procureur, I added, there you have all your case overthrown by your own witness. Nevertheless, we were all condemned for having belonged to the International. Four of us got the maximum sentence, five years' imprisonment and a hundred pounds fine. The remainder got from four years to one year. In fact, our accusers never tried to prove anything concerning the International. It was quite forgotten. We were simply asked to speak about anarchism, and so we did. Not a word was said about the explosions and when one or two of the Lyon comrades wanted to have this point cleared up, they were bluntly told that they were not prosecuted for that, but for having belonged to the International, to which I alone belonged. There is always some comical incident in such trials, and this time it was supplied by a letter of mine. There was nothing upon which to base the whole accusation. Scores of searches had been made at the French anarchists, but only two letters of mine had been found. The prosecution tried to make the best of them. One was written to a French worker, who felt despondent and disheartened. I spoke to him in my letter about the great times we were living in, the great changes coming, the birth and spreading of new ideas, and so on. The letter was not long, and little capital was made out of it by the procureur. As to the other letter, it was twelve pages long, I had written it to another French friend, a young shoemaker. He earned his living by making shoes in his own room for a shop. On his left side he used to have a small iron stove, upon which he himself cooked his daily meal, and upon his right a small stool, upon which he wrote long letters to the comrades, without leaving his shoemaker's low bench. After he had made just as many pairs of shoes as were required for covering the expenses of his extremely modest living, and for sending a few francs to his old mother in the country, he would spend long hours in writing letters in which he developed the theoretical principles of anarchism with admirable good sense and intelligence. He is now a writer, well known in France and generally respected for the integrity of his character. Unfortunately, 
At that time he would cover eight or twelve pages of note paper without having put one single full stop, or even a comma. I once sat down and wrote a long letter in which I explained to him how our thoughts subdivide into groups of sentences, which must be marked by full stops, into separate sentences which must be separated by stops, and finally into secondary ones, which deserve the charity of being marked at least with commas. I told him how much it would improve his writings if he took this simple precaution. This letter was read by the prosecutor before the court and elicited from him most pathetic comments. You have heard, gentlemen, this letter, he went on, addressing the court. You have listened to it. There is nothing particular in it at first sight. He gives a lesson of grammar to a worker. But, and here his voice vibrated with accents of deep emotion, it was not in order to help a poor worker in instruction which he, owing probably to his laziness, failed to get at school. It was not to help him in earning an honest living. No, gentlemen, it was written in order to inspire him with hatred for our grand and beautiful institutions, in order only the better to infuse him with the venom of anarchism, in order to make of him only a more terrible enemy of society. Cursed be the day that Kropotkin put his foot on the soil of France, he exclaimed, with a wonderful pathos. We could not help laughing like boys all the time he delivered that speech. The judges stared at him, as if to tell him that he was overdoing his role. But he seemed not to notice anything, and, carried on by his eloquence, he went on speaking with more and more theatrical gestures and intonations. He really did his best to obtain his reward from the Russian government. Very soon after the condemnation, the presiding magistrate was promoted to the magistracy of an assize court. As to the procureur and another magistrate, one would hardly believe it. The Russian government offered them the Russian cross of St. Anne, and they were allowed by the Republic to accept it. The famous Russian alliance had thus its origin in the Lyon trial. This trial, which lasted a fortnight, during which most brilliant anarchist speeches, reported by all the papers, were made by such first-rate speakers as the worker Bernard and Emile Gautier, and during which all the accused took a very firm attitude preaching all the time our doctrines, had a powerful influence in spreading anarchist ideas in France, and assuredly contributed to some extent to the revival of socialism in other countries. As to the condemnation, it was so little justified by the proceedings that the French press, with the exception of the papers devoted to the government, openly blamed the magistrates. Even the moderate Journal des Economistes blamed the condemnation which nothing in the proceedings of the court could have made one foresee. The contest between the accusers and ourselves was won by us in the public opinion. Immediately a proposition of amnesty was brought before the chamber, and received about a hundred votes in support of it. It came up regularly every year, each time securing more and more votes, until we were released. End of Western Europe, Chapter 12 Western Europe, Chapter 13 Of Memoirs of a Revolutionist, Volume 2, by Peter Kropotkin This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Eileen The trial was over, but I remained for another couple of months at the Lyon prison. Most of my comrades had lodged an appeal against the decision of the police court, and we had to wait for its results. With four more comrades I refused to take any part in that appeal to a higher court, and continued to work in my pistole. A great friend of mine, Martin, a clothier from Vienne, took another pistole by the side of the one which I occupied, and as we were already condemned, we were allowed to take our walks together, and when we had something to say to each other between the walks, we used to correspond by means of taps on the wall, just as in Russia. Already during my sojourn at Lyon I began to realize the awfully demoralizing influence of the prisons upon the prisoners, which brought me later to condemn unconditionally the whole institution. The Lyon prison is a modern prison, built in the shape of a star, on the cellular system. 
The spaces between the rays of the star-like building are occupied by small asphalt-paved yards, and, weather permitting, the inmates are taken to these yards to work outdoors. They mostly beat out the unwound silk cocoons to obtain floss silk. Flocks of children are also taken at certain hours to these yards. Thin, emasculated, underfed, the shadows of children. I often watched them from my window. Anemia was plainly written on all the little faces and manifest in their thin, shivering bodies, and not only in the dormitories but also in the yards, in the full light of the sun, they themselves increase their anemia. What will become of these children after they have passed through that schooling and come out with their health ruined, their will annihilated, their energy weakened? Anemia, with its weakened energy and unwillingness to work, its enfeebled will, weakened intellect, and perverted imagination, is responsible for crime to an infinitely greater extent than plethora, and it is precisely this enemy of the human race which is bred in prison. And then, the teachings which the children receive in these surroundings. Mere isolation, even if it were rigorously carried out, and it cannot be, would be of little avail. The whole atmosphere of every prison is an atmosphere of glorification of that sort of gambling and clever strokes, which constitutes the very essence of theft, swindling, and all sorts of similar antisocial deeds. Whole generations of future prisoners are bred in these nurseries, which the state supports and society tolerates, simply because it does not want to hear its own diseases spoken of and dissected. Imprisoned in childhood, prison bird for life, was what I heard afterwards from all those who were interested in criminal matters. And when I saw these children and realized what they had to expect in the future, I could not but continually ask myself, which of them is the worst criminal, this child or the judge who condemns every year hundreds of children to this fate? I gladly admit that the crime of these judges is unconscious. But are, then, all the crimes for which people are sent to prison as conscious as they are supposed to be? There was another point which I vividly realized since the very first weeks of my imprisonment, but which, in some inconceivable way, escapes the attention of both the judges and the writers on criminal law, namely, that imprisonment in an immense number of cases is a punishment which strikes quite innocent people far more severely than the condemned prisoners themselves. Nearly every one of my comrades, who represented a fair average of the working men population, had either their wife and children to support, or a sister or an old mother who depended for their living upon his earnings. Now, being left without support, these women did their best to get work, and some of them got it, but none of them succeeded in earning regularly even as much as fifteen pence a day. Nine francs, less than eight shillings and often six shillings a week, to support themselves and their children was all they could earn. And that meant evidently underfeeding, privations of all sorts, and the deterioration of the health of the wife and the children, weakened intellect, weakened energy and will. I thus realized that what was going on in our law courts was in reality a condemnation of quite innocent people to all sorts of hardships, in most cases even worse than those to which the condemned man himself is submitted. The fiction is that the law punishes the man by inflicting upon him a variety of physical and degrading hardships. But man is such a creature that whatever hardships be imposed upon him, he gradually grows accustomed to them. As he cannot modify them, he accepts them, and after a certain time he puts up with them, just as he puts up with a chronic disease and grows insensible to it. But what, during his imprisonment, becomes of his wife and children, that is, of the innocent people who depend upon him for support? They are punished even more cruelly than he himself is. And in our routine habits of thought, no one ever thinks of the immense injustice which is thus committed. I realized it only from actual experience. In the middle of March 1883, Twenty-two of us who had been condemned to more than one year of imprisonment were removed in great secrecy to the central prison of Clairvaux. It was formerly an abbey of St. Bernard, 
of which the great revolution had made a house for the poor. Subsequently it became a house of detention and correction, which went among the prisoners and the officials themselves under the well-deserved nickname of House of Detention and Corruption. So long as we were kept at Lyon, we were treated as the prisoners under preliminary arrest are treated in France. That is, we had our own clothes, we could get our own food from a restaurant, and one could hire for a few francs per month a larger cell, a pistole. I took advantage of this for working hard upon my articles for the Encyclopedia Britannica in the nineteenth century. Now, the treatment we should have at Clairvaux was an open question. However, in France it is generally understood that, for political prisoners, the loss of liberty and forced inactivity are themselves so hard that there is no need to inflict additional hardships. Consequently, we were told that we should remain under the regime of preliminary detention. We should have separate quarters, retain our own clothes, be free from compulsory work, and be allowed to smoke. Those of you, the governor said, who wish to earn something by manual work, will be enabled to do so by sewing stays, or engraving small things in mother-of-pearl. This work is poorly paid, but you could not be employed in the prison workshops for the fabrication of iron beds, picture frames, and so on, because that would require your lodging with the common-law prisoners. Like the other prisoners, we were allowed to buy from the prison canteen some additional food and a pint of claret every day, both being supplied at a very low price and of good quality. The first impression which Clairvaux produced upon me was most favorable. We had been locked up and had been traveling all the day, from two or three o'clock in the morning, in those tiny cupboards into which the cellular railway carriages are usually divided. When we reached the central prison, we were taken temporarily to the cellular, or punishment, quarters, and were introduced into the usual, but extremely clean, cells. Hot food, plain but of excellent quality, had been served to us notwithstanding the late hour of the night, and we had been offered the opportunity of having the half-pint of very good vin de pie, local wine, which was sold to the prisoners by the prison canteen at the extremely low price of twenty-four centimes, less than two and a half d per quart. The governor and the warders were most polite to us. Next day the governor of the prison took me to see the rooms which he intended to give us, and when I remarked that they were all right, but only a little too small for such a number, we were twenty-two, and that overcrowding might result in illness, he gave us another set of rooms in what was in olden times the house of the superintendent of the abbey, and now was the hospital. Our windows looked out upon a little garden, and beyond it we had beautiful views of the surrounding country. In another room on the same landing, old Blanqui had been kept the last three or four years before his release. Before that he had been imprisoned in the cellular house. Besides the three spacious rooms which were given to us, a smaller room was spared for Gautier and myself, so that we could pursue our literary work. We probably owed this last favor to the intervention of a considerable number of Englishmen of science, who, as soon as I was condemned, had addressed a petition to the President asking for my release. Many contributors to the Encyclopedia Britannica, as well as Herbert Spencer and Swinburne, had signed while Victor Hugo had added to his signature a few warm words. Altogether, public opinion in France received our condemnation very unfavorably, and when my wife had mentioned at Paris that I required books, the Academy of Sciences offered the use of its library, and Ernest Renan, in a charming letter, put his private library at her service. We had a small garden, where we could play ninepence or jeu de boule, we managed, however, to cultivate a narrow bed running along the wall, and, on a surface of some eighty square yards, we grew almost incredible quantities of lettuces and radishes, as well as some flowers. I need not say that we at once organized classes, and during the three years that we remained at Clairvaux, I gave my comrades lessons in cosmography, geometry, or physics, also aiding them in the study of languages. Nearly everyone learned at least one language. 
English, German, Italian, or Spanish, while a few learned too. We also managed to do some bookbinding, having learned how from one of those excellent Encyclopédie Gauguet booklets. At the end of the first year, my health again gave way. Clairvaux is built on marshy ground, upon which a malaria is endemic, and malaria with scurvy laid hold of me. Then my wife, who was studying at Paris, working in Wurtz's laboratory and preparing to take an examination for the degree of Doctor of Science, abandoned everything and came to stay in the hamlet of Clairvaux, which consists of less than a dozen houses grouped at the foot of an immense high wall which encircles the prison. Of course, her life in that hamlet, with the prison wall opposite, was anything but gay, yet she stayed there till I was released. During the first year she was allowed to see me only once in two months, and all interviews were held in the presence of a warder who sat between us. But when she settled at Clairvaux, declaring her firm intention to remain there, she was soon permitted to see me every day, in one of the small guardhouses of the warders within the prison walls, and food was brought me from the inn where she stayed. Later, we were even allowed to take a walk in the governor's garden, closely watched all the time, and usually one of my comrades joined us in the walk. I was quite astonished to discover that the central prison of Clairvaux had all the aspects of a small manufacturing town, surrounded by orchards and cornfields, all encircled by an outer wall. The fact is that if in a French central prison the inmates are perhaps more dependent upon the fancies and caprices of the governor and the warders than they seem to be in English prisons, the treatment of the prisoners is far more humane than it is in the corresponding lock-ups on this side of the channel. The medieval spirit of revenge, which still prevails in English prisons, has long since been given up in France. The imprisoned man is not compelled to sleep on planks, or to have a mattress on alternate days only. The day he comes to prison he gets a decent bed and retains it. He is not compelled either to do degrading work, such as to climb a wheel, or to pick oakum. He is employed, on the contrary, in useful work, and this is why the Clairvaux prison has the aspect of a manufacturing town in which iron furniture, picture frames, looking-glasses, metric measures, velvet, linen, ladies' stays, small things in mother-of-pearl, wooden shoes, and so on, are fabricated by the nearly sixteen hundred men who are kept there. Moreover, if the punishment for insubordination is very cruel, there is none of the flogging which still goes on in English prisons. Such a punishment would be absolutely impossible in France. Altogether, the central prison at Clairvaux may be described as one of the best prisons in Europe. And yet, the results obtained at Clairvaux are as bad as in any one of the lock-ups of the old type. The watchword nowadays is to say that prisoners are reformed in our prisons, one of the members of the prison administration once said to me, This is all nonsense, and I shall never be induced to tell such a lie. The pharmacy at Clairvaux was underneath the rooms which we occupied, and we occasionally had some contact with the prisoners who were employed in it. One of them was a grey-haired man in his fifties, who ended his term while we were there. It was touching to learn how he parted with the prison. He knew that in a few months or weeks he would be back, and begged the doctor to keep the place at the pharmacy open for him. This was not his first visit to Clairvaux, and he knew it would not be the last. When he was set free, he had not a soul in the world to whom he might go to spend his old age. Who will care to employ me, he said, and what trade have I? None. When I am out, I must go to my old comrades, they at least, will surely receive me as an old friend. Then would come a glass too much to drink in their company, excited talk about some capital fun, some capital new stroke to be made in the way of theft, and, partly from weakness of will, partly to oblige his only friends, he would join in it, and would be locked up once more. So it had been several times before in his life. Two months passed, however, after his release, and he was not yet back to Clairvaux, then the prisoners and the warders, too, began to feel uneasy about him. Has he had time to move to another judicial district, that he is not back yet? One can only hope that he has not been involved in some bad affair, they would say, 
meaning something worse than theft. That would be a pity. He was such a nice, quiet man. But it soon appeared that the first supposition was the right one. Word came from another prison that the old man was locked up there, and was now endeavouring to be transferred to Clairvaux. The old prisoners were the most pitiful sight. Many of them had begun their prison experience in childhood or early youth, others at a riper age. But once in prison, always in prison, such is the saying derived from experience. And now, having reached or passed over the age of sixty, they knew that they must end their lives in a jail. To quicken their departure from life, the prison administration used to send them to the workshops where felt socks were made out of all sorts of woolen refuse. The dust in the workshop soon gave these old men consumption, which finally released them. Then four fellow prisoners would carry the old comrade to the common grave, the graveyard warder and his black dog being the only two beings to follow him, and while the prison priest would march in front of the procession, mechanically reciting his prayer and looking round at the chestnut or fir trees along the road, and the four comrades carrying the coffin would enjoy their momentary escape out of prison, the black dog would be the only being affected by the solemnity of the ceremony. When the reformed central prisons were introduced in France, it was believed that the principle of absolute silence could be maintained in them. But it is so contrary to human nature that its strict enforcement had to be abandoned. In fact, even solitary confinement is no obstacle to intercourse between the prisoners. To the outward observer the prison seems to be quite mute, but in reality life goes on in it as busily as in a small town. In suppressed voices, by means of whispers, hurriedly dropped words, and scraps of notes. Every news of any interest spreads immediately all over the prison. Nothing can happen either among the prisoners themselves, or in the Cour d'Honneur, where the lodgings of the administration are situated, or in the village of Clairvaux, where the employers of the factories live, or in the wide world of Paris politics, but that it is communicated at once throughout all the dormitories, workshops, and cells. Frenchmen are of too communicative a nature for their underground telegraph ever to be stopped. We had no intercourse with the common law prisoners, and yet we knew all the news of the day. John, the gardener, is back for two years. Such an inspector's wife has had a fearful scrimmage with so-and-so's wife. James, in the cells, has been caught transmitting a note of friendship to John from the framer's workshop. That old beast so-and-so is no more minister of justice, the ministry has been upset. And so on. And when the news goes that Jack has got two five-penny packets of tobacco in exchange for two flannel spencers, it flies round the prison in no time. Demands for tobacco were continually pouring in upon us and when a small lawyer detained in the prison wanted to transmit to me a note, in order to ask my wife, who was staying in the village, to see from time to time his wife, who was also there, quite a number of men took the liveliest interest in the transmission of that message, which had to pass I do not know how many hands before it reached its goal. And when there was something that might specially interest us in a paper, this paper, in some unaccountable way, would reach us, with a little stone wrapped into it, to help its being thrown over a high wall. Cellular imprisonment is no obstacle to communication. When we came to Clairvaux and were first lodged in the cellular quarter, it was bitterly cold in the cells, so cold, indeed, that when I wrote to my wife, who was then at Paris, and she got my letter, she did not recognize the writing, my hand being so stiff with the cold. The order came to heat the cells as much as possible, but do what they might, the cells remained as cold as ever. It appeared afterwards that all the hot air tubes in the cells were choked with scraps of paper, bits of notes, penknives, and all sorts of small things which several generations of prisoners had concealed in the pipes. Martin, the same friend of mine whom I have already mentioned, obtained permission to serve part of his time in cellular confinement. He preferred isolation to life in a room with a dozen comrades, and went to a cell in the cellular building. To his great astonishment he found that he was not at all alone in his cell. The walls and the keyholes spoke round him. 
In a day or two all the inmates of the cells knew who he was, and he had acquaintances all over the building. Quite a life goes on, as in a beehive, between the seemingly isolated cells. Only that life often takes such a character as to make it belong entirely to the domain of psychopathy. Kraft Ebbing himself had no idea of the aspects it takes with certain prisoners in solitary confinement. I will not repeat here what I have said in a book, in Russian and French prisons, which I published in England in 1886, soon after my release from Cairo, upon the moral influence of prisoners upon prisoners. But there is one thing which must be said. The prison population consists of heterogeneous elements, but, taking only those who are usually described as the criminals proper, and of whom we have heard so much lately from Lombroso and his followers, what struck me most as regards them was that the prisons, which are considered as preventive measure against antisocial deeds, are exactly the institutions for breeding them and for rendering these offences worse and worse after a man has received prison education. Everyone knows that the absence of education, the dislike of regular work acquired since childhood, the physical unpreparedness for sustained effort, the love of adventure when it receives a wrong direction, the gambling propensities, the absence of energy and an untrained will, and carelessness about the happiness of others, are the causes which bring this category of men before the courts. Now I was deeply impressed during my imprisonment by the fact that it is exactly these defects of human nature, each one of them, which the prison breeds in its inmates and it is bound to breed them because it is a prison, and will breed them so long as there are prisons. Incarceration in a prison necessarily, fatally, destroys the energy of a man, and still more kills his will. In prison life there is no room for exercising one's will. To possess one's own will in prison means surely to get into trouble. The will of the prisoner must be killed, and it is killed. Still less is the room for exercising one's natural sympathies, everything being done to destroy free contact with those outside the prison, and within it, with whom the prisoner may have feelings of sympathy. Physically and mentally he is rendered less and less prepared for sustained effort, and if he has had formerly a dislike for regular work, this dislike is only the more increased during his prison years. If, before he first came to the prison, he soon felt tired by monotonous work, which he could not do properly, or had a grudge against underpaid overwork, his dislike now becomes hatred. If he doubted about the social utility of current rules of morality, now, after having cast a critical glance upon the official defenders of these rules, and learned his comrades' opinions of them, he openly cast the rules overboard. And if he has got into trouble in consequence of a morbid development of the passionate sensual side of his nature, now, after having spent a number of years in prison, this morbid character is still more developed, in many cases to an appalling extent. In this last direction, the most dangerous of all, prison education is most effective. In Siberia I had seen with sinks of filth and what workshops of physical and moral deterioration the dirty, overcrowded, unreformed Russian prisons were. And at the age of nineteen, I imagined that if there were less overcrowding in the rooms, and a certain classification of the prisoners, and healthy occupations were provided for them, the institution might be substantially improved. Now I had to part with these illusions. I could convince myself that as regards their effects upon the prisoners, and their results for society at large, the best reformed prisons, whether cellular or not, are as bad as, or even worse, than the dirty lock-ups of old. They do not reform the prisoners. On the contrary, in the immense, overwhelming majority of cases, they exercise upon them the most deteriorating effect. The thief, the swindler, the rough man, and so on, who has spent some years in a prison, comes out of it more ready than ever to resume his former career. He is better prepared for it, he has learned how to do it better, he is more embittered against society, and he finds a more solid justification for being in revolt against its laws and customs. 
necessarily, unavoidably, he is bound to go farther and farther along the antisocial path which first brought him before a law court. The offences he will commit after his release will be graver than those which first got him into trouble, and he is doomed to finish his life in a prison or in a hard labour colony. In the above-mentioned book I wrote that prisons are universities of crime maintained by the state. And now, thinking of it at fifteen years' distance, in the light of my subsequent experience, I can only confirm that statement of mine. Personally, I have no reason whatever to complain of the years I have spent in a French prison. For an active and independent man, the restraint of liberty and activity is in itself so great a privation that all the remainder, all the petty miseries of prison life, are not worth speaking of. Of course, when we heard of the active political life which was going on in France, we resented very much our forced inactivity. The end of the first year, especially during a gloomy winter, is always hard for the prisoner. And when spring comes, one feels more strongly than ever the want of liberty. When I saw from our windows the meadows assuming their green garb, and the hills covered with a spring haze, or when I saw a train flying into a dale between the hills, I certainly felt a strong desire to follow it, to breathe the air of the woods, to be carried along with the stream of human life into a busy town. But one who casts his lot with an advanced party must be prepared to spend a number of years in prison, and he need not grudge it. He feels that even during his imprisonment he remains not quite an inactive part of the stream of human progress, which spreads and strengthens the ideas which are dear to him. At Lyon, my comrades, my wife and myself, certainly found the warders a very rough set of men. But after a couple of encounters all was set right. Moreover, the prison administration knew that we had the Paris press with us, and they did not want to draw upon themselves the thunders of Rochefort or the cutting criticisms of Clemenceau. And at Clairvaux there was no need of such a restraint. All the administration had been renewed a few months before we came thither. A prisoner had been killed by warders in his cell, and his corpse had been hanged to simulate suicide. But this time the affair leaked out through the doctor. The governor was dismissed, and altogether a better tone prevailed in the prison. I took back from Clairvaux the best recollections of its governor, and altogether while I was there I more than once thought that after all Men are often better than the institutions to which they belong. But having no personal griefs, I can all the more freely and most unconditionally condemn the institution itself as a survival from the dark past, wrong in its principles, and a source of unfathomable evil to society. One thing more I must mention, as it struck me, perhaps, even more than the demoralizing effects of prisons upon their inmates. What a nest of infection is every prison, and even a law court for its neighborhood, for the people who live about them. Lombroso has made very much of the criminal type which he believes to have discovered amongst the inmates of the prisons. If he had made the same efforts to observe people who hang about the law courts, detectives, spies, small solicitors, informers, people preying upon simpletons, and the like, he would probably have concluded that his criminal type has a far greater geographical extension than the prison walls. I never saw such a collection of faces of the lowest human type, sunk far below the average type of mankind, as I saw by the score round and within the Palais de Justice at Lyon, certainly not within the prison walls of Clairvaux. Dickens and Cruikshank have immortalized a few of these types but they represent quite a world which gravitates around the law courts and infuses its infection far and wide around them. And the same is true of each central prison like Clairvaux. Quite an atmosphere of petty thefts, petty swindlings, spying and corruption of all sorts spreads like a blot of oil around every prison. I saw all this, and if before my condemnation I already knew that society is wrong in its present system of punishments, after I left Clairvaux, I knew that it is not only wrong and unjust in this system, but that it is simply foolish when, in its partly unconscious and partly willful ignorance of realities, 
it maintains at its own expense these universities of crime and these sinks of corruption acting under the illusion that they are necessary as a bridle to the criminal instincts of man end of western europe chapter 13《Western Europe》Chapter 14 of《Memoirs of a Revolutionist》Volume 2 by Peter Kropotkin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Eileen. Every revolutionist meets a number of spies and agents provocateurs in his path, and I have had my fair share of them. All governments spend considerable sums of money in maintaining this kind of reptile. However, they are mainly dangerous to young people. One who has had some experience of life and men soon discovers that there is about these creatures something which puts him on his guard. They are recruited from the scum of society, amongst men of the lowest moral standard, and if one is watchful of the moral character of the men he meets with, he soon notices something in the manners of these pillars of society which shocks him, and then he asks himself the question, What has brought this person to me? What in the world can he have in common with us? In most cases, this simple question is sufficient to put a man upon his guard. When I first came to Geneva, the agent of the Russian government who had been commissioned to spy the refugees was well known to all of us. He went under the name of Count Something, but as he had no footman and no carriage on which to emblazon his coronet and arms, he had had them embroidered on a sort of mantle which covered his tiny dog, we saw him occasionally in the cafés, without speaking to him. He was, in fact, an innocent, who simply bought in the kiosks all the publications of the exiles, very probably adding to them such comments as he thought would please his chiefs. Different men began to pour in when Geneva was peopled with more and more refugees of the young generation, and yet, in one way or another, they also became known to us. When a stranger appeared on our horizon, he was asked with usual nihilist frankness about his past and his present prospects, and it soon appeared what sort of person he or she was. Frankness in mutual intercourse is altogether the best way for bringing about proper relations between men. In this case it was invaluable. Numbers of persons whom none of us had known or heard of in Russia, absolute strangers to the circles, came to Geneva and many of them, a few days or even hours after their arrival, stood on the most friendly terms with the colony of refugees. But in some way or another the spies never succeeded in crossing the threshold of familiarity. A spy might make common acquaintances. He might give the best accounts, sometimes correct, of his past in Russia. He might possess in perfection the nihilist slang and manners but he never could assimilate the particular kind of nihilist ethics which had grown up amongst the Russian youth, and this alone kept him at a distance from our colony. Spies can imitate anything else but those ethics. When I was working with Reclus, there was at Clarence one such individual, from whom we all kept aloof. We knew nothing bad about him, but we felt that he was not ours, and as he tried only the more to penetrate into our society, we became suspicious of him. I had never said a word to him, and consequently he was especially after me. Seeing that he could not approach me through the usual channels, he began to write me letters, giving me mysterious appointments for mysterious purposes in the woods and in similar places. For fun, I once accepted his invitation and went to the spot, with a good friend following me at a distance. But the man, who probably had a confederate, must have noticed that I was not alone, and did not appear. So I was spared the pleasure of ever saying to him a single word. Besides, I worked at that time so hard that every minute of my time was taken up either with the geography or le revolt, and I entered into no conspiracies. However, we learned later on that this man used to send to the third section Detailed reports about the supposed conversations which he had had with me, my supposed confidences, and the terrible plots which I was concocting at St. Petersburg against the Tsar's life. 
All that was taken for ready money at St. Petersburg. And in Italy, too. When Caffiero was arrested one day in Switzerland, he was shown formidable reports of Italian spies who warned their government that Caffiero and I, loaded with bombs, were going to enter Italy. The fact was that I never was in Italy, and never had had any intention of visiting the country. In point of fact, however, the spies do not always fabricate reports wholesale. They often tell things that are true, but all depends upon the way a story is told. We passed some merry moments about a report which was addressed to the French government by a French spy who followed my wife and myself as we were travelling in 1881 from Paris to London. The spy, probably playing a double part, as they often do, had sold that report to Rochefort, who published it in his paper. Everything that the spy had told in this report was correct, but the way he had told it. He wrote, for instance, I took the next compartment to the one that Kropotkin had taken with his wife. Quite true, he was there. We noticed him, for he had managed at once to attract our attention by his sullen, unpleasant face. They spoke Russian all the time, in order not to be understood by the other passengers. Very true again, we spoke Russian as we always do. When they came to Calais, they both took a bouillon. Most correct again, we took a bouillon. But here the mysterious part of the journey begins. After that they both disappeared, and I looked for them in vain, on the platform and elsewhere. And when they reappeared, he was in disguise, and was followed by a Russian priest, who never left him until they reached London, where I lost sight of the priest. All that was true again. My wife had a slight toothache, and I asked the keeper of the restaurant to let us go into his private room, where the tooth could be stopped. So we had disappeared indeed, and as we had to cross the channel, I put my soft felt hat into my pocket and put on a fur cap, so I was in disguise. As to the mysterious priest, he was also there. He was not a Russian, but this is irrelevant. He wore at any rate the dress of the Greek priests. I saw him standing at the counter and asking something which no one understood. Agua, agua, he repeated in a woeful tone. Give the gentleman a glass of water, I said to the waiter. Whereupon the priest began to thank me for my intervention, with a truly eastern effusion. My wife took pity on him and spoke to him in different languages, but he understood none but modern Greek. It appeared at last that he knew a few words in one of the South Slavonian languages, and we could make out, I'm a Greek, Turkish Embassy, London. We told him, mostly by signs, that we too were going to London, and that he might travel with us. The most amusing part of the story was that I really found for him the address of the Turkish embassy, even before we had reached Charing Cross. The train stopped at some station on the way, and two elegant ladies entered our already full third-class compartment. Both had newspapers in their hands. One was English, and the other, a tall, nice-looking person who spoke good French, pretended to be English. After having exchanged a few words, she asked me, a brûle pour point, what do you think of Count Ignatieff? And immediately after that, are you soon going to kill the new Tsar? I was clear as to her profession from these two questions, but thinking of my priest, I said to her, do you happen to know the address of the Turkish embassy? Street so-and-so, number so-and-so, she replied without hesitation, like a schoolgirl in a class. You could, I suppose, also give the address of the Russian embassy, I asked her, and the address having been given with the same readiness, I communicated both to the priest. When we reached Charing Cross, the lady was so obsequiously anxious to attend to my luggage, and even to carry a heavy package herself with her gloved hands, that I finally told her, much to her surprise, Enough of that. Ladies do not carry gentlemen's luggage. Go away. But to return to my trustworthy French spy. He alighted at Charing Cross, he wrote in his report, but for more than half an hour after the arrival of the train he did not leave the station, until he had ascertained that everyone else had left it. I kept aloof in the meantime, concealing myself behind a pillar. Having ascertained that all passengers had left the platform, they both suddenly jumped into a cab. 
I followed them nevertheless, and overheard the address which the cabman gave at the gate to the policeman, 12 Street so-and-so, and ran after the cab. There were no cabs in the neighborhood, so I ran up to Trafalgar Square, where I got one, and he alighted at the above address. All facts in this narrative are true again, the address and all the rest, but how mysterious it all reads. I had warned a Russian friend of my arrival, but there was a dense fog that morning, and my friend overslept himself. We waited for him half an hour, and then, leaving our luggage in the cloakroom, drove to his house. There they sat till two o'clock with the drawn curtains, and then a tall man came out of the house, and returned one hour later with their luggage. Even the remark about the curtains was correct. We had to light the gas on account of the fog, and drew down the curtains to get rid of the ugly sight of a small Islington street wrapped in a dense fog. When I was working with Elisir Reclus at Clarence, I used to go every fortnight to Geneva to see to the bringing out of Le Revolt. One day, as I came to our printing office, I was told that a Russian gentleman wanted to see me. He had already seen my friends, and had told them that he came to induce me to start a paper like Le Revolt in Russian. He offered for that purpose all the money that might be required. I was to meet him in a café, where he gave me a German name, Tonlem, let us say, and told me that he was a native of the Baltic provinces. He boasted of possessing a large fortune in certain estates and manufactures, and he was extremely angry with the Russian government for the Russianizing schemes. On the whole he produced a somewhat indefinite impression so that my friends insisted upon my accepting his offer, but I did not much like the man from first sight. From the café he took me to his rooms in an hotel, and there began to show less reserve and to appear more like himself and in a still more unpleasant light. "'Don't doubt my fortune,' he said to me. "'I have made a capital invention. There is a lot of money in it. I shall patent it and get a considerable sum for it and give it all for the cause of the revolution in Russia.' and he showed me, to my astonishment, a miserable candlestick, the originality of which was that it was awfully ugly and had three bits of wire to put the candle in. The poorest housewife would not have cared for such a candlestick, and even if it could have been patented, no ironmonger would have paid the patentee more than a couple of sovereigns. A rich man placing his hopes on such a candlestick. This man, I thought to myself, can never have seen better ones, and my opinion about him was made up. He was no rich man at all, and the money he offered was not his own. So I bluntly told him, Very well, if you are so anxious to have a Russian revolutionary paper, and hold the flattering opinion about myself which you have expressed, you will have to put your money in my name at a bank, and at my entire disposal. But I warn you that you will have absolutely nothing to do with the paper. Of course, of course, he said, but just to see to it, and sometimes advise you and aid you in smuggling it into Russia. No, nothing of the sort. You need not see me at all. My friends thought that I was too hard upon the man, but some time after that a letter was received from St. Petersburg, warning us that we would have the visit of a spy of the third section, Tonlem by name. The candlestick had thus rendered us a good service. Candlesticks, or anything else, these people almost always betray themselves in one way or another. When we were at London in 1881, we received, on a foggy morning, the visit of two Russians. I knew one of them by name. The other, a young man whom he recommended as his friend, was a stranger. He had volunteered to accompany his friend on a few days' visit to England. As he was introduced by a friend, I had no suspicions whatever about him, but I was very busy that day with some work, and asked another friend who stayed close by to find them rooms and to take them about to see London. My wife had not yet seen London either, and she went with them. In the afternoon she returned, saying to me, Do you know I dislike that man very much? Beware of him. But why? What's the matter? I asked. Nothing, absolutely nothing, but he is surely not ours by the way he treated the waiter in a café, and the way he handles money, I saw at once that he is not ours, and if he is not, why should he come to us? She was so certain of her suspicions that, 
while she performed her duties of hospitality she nevertheless managed never to leave that young man alone in my study even for one minute we had a chat and the visitor began to exhibit himself more and more under such a low moral aspect that even his friend blushed for him and when i asked more details about him the explanations he gave were even still less satisfactory we were both on our guard in short they both left london in a couple of days and a fortnight later i got a letter from my russian friend full of excuses for having introduced to me the young man who they had found out at paris was a spy in the service of the russian embassy i looked then into a list of russian secret service agents in france and switzerland which we the refugees had received lately from the executive committee they had their men everywhere at st petersburg and i found the name of that young man on the list with one letter only altered in it to start a paper subsidized by the police with a police agent at its head is an old plan and the prefect of the paris police andrieu resorted to it in eighteen eighty one i was with elise reclus in the mountains when we received a letter from a frenchman or rather a belgian who announced to us that he was going to start an anarchist paper at paris and asked our collaboration the letter full of flatteries produced upon us an unpleasant impression and the reclus had moreover some vague reminiscence of having heard the name of the writer in some unfavourable connection we decided to refuse collaboration and i wrote to a paris friend that we must first of all ascertain from whence the money came with which the paper was going to be started it may come from the orleanists an old trick of the family and we must know its origin my paris friend with a workman's straightforwardness read that letter at a meeting at which the would-be editor of the paper was present he simulated offence and i had to answer several letters on this subject but i stuck to my words if the man is in earnest he must show us the origin of the money and so he did at last pressed by questions he said that the money came from his aunt a rich lady of antiquated opinions who yielded however to his fancy of having a paper and had parted with the money the lady was not in france she was staying at london we insisted nevertheless upon having her name and address and our friend Malatesta volunteered to see her. He went with an Italian friend who was connected with the second-hand trade in furniture. They found the lady occupying a small flat, and while Malatesta spoke to her and was more and more convinced that she was simply playing the aunt's part in the comedy, the furniture friend, looking round at the chairs and tables, discovered that all of them had been taken the day before, probably hired, from a second-hand furniture dealer his neighbour the labels of the dealer were still fastened to the chairs and the tables this did not prove much but naturally reinforced our suspicions i absolutely refused to have anything to do with the paper the paper was of an unheard-of violence burning assassination dynamite bombs there was nothing but that in it I met the man, the editor of the paper, as I went to the London Congress, and the moment I saw his sullen face, and heard a bit of his talk, and caught a glance of the sort of women with whom he always went about, my opinions concerning him were settled. At the Congress, during which he introduced all sorts of terrible resolutions, the delegates kept aloof from him, and when he insisted upon having the addresses of anarchists all over the world, the refusal was made in anything but a flattering manner to make a long story short he was unmasked a couple of months later and the paper was stopped for ever on that very next day then a couple of years after that the prefect of police andrieux published his memoirs and in this book he told all about the paper which he had started and the explosions which his agents had organized at paris by putting sardine boxes filled with something under the statue of the air. one can imagine the quantities of money all these things cost the french and every other nation i might write several chapters on this subject but i will mention only one more story of two adventurers at clairvaux 
My wife stayed in the only inn of the little village which had grown up under the shadow of the prison wall. One day the landlady entered her room with a message from two gentlemen who came to the hotel and wanted to see my wife. The landlady interceded with all her eloquence in their favour. "'Oh, I know the world,' she said, "'and I may assure you, madame, that they are the most correct gentlemen. Nothing could be more comme il faut. One of them gave the name of a German officer. He is surely a baron or a milord, and the other is his interpreter. They know you perfectly well. The baron is going now to Africa, perhaps never to return, and he wants to see you before he leaves.' My wife looked at the address of the message, which was, à Madame la Principesse Kropotkine, and needed no further proof of the comme il faut of the two gentlemen. As to the contents of the message, they were even worse than the address. Against all rules of grammar and common sense, the baron wrote about a mysterious communication which he had to make. She refused point-blank to receive the baron and his interpreter. Thereupon the baron wrote to my wife letter upon letter, which she returned unopened. All the village soon became divided into two parties, one siding with the baron and led by the landlady, and the other against him, and headed, as a matter of fact, by the landlady's husband. Quite a romance was circulated. The baron had known my wife before her marriage. He had danced with her many times at the Russian embassy in Vienna. He was still in love with her, but she, the cruel one, refused even to allow him to cast a glance at her before he went upon his perilous expedition. Then came the mysterious story of a boy whom we were said to conceal. Where is their boy? the baron wanted to know. They have a son, six years old by this time. Where is he? She never would part with a boy if she had one, the one party said. Yes, they have one, but they conceal him the other party maintained. For us, too, this contest was a very interesting revelation. It proved that our letters were not only read by the prison authorities, but that their contents were made known to the Russian embassy as well. When I was at Lyon, and my wife went to see Elisir Reclus in Switzerland, she wrote to me once that our boy was going on well. His health was excellent, and they all spent a very nice evening at the anniversary of his fifth birthday. I knew that she meant Le Revolt, which we often used to name in conversation our gamin, our naughty boy. But now that these gentlemen were inquiring about our gamin, and even designated so correctly his age, it was evident that the letter had passed through other hands than those of the governor. It was well to know such a thing. Nothing escapes the attention of village folk in the country, and the baron soon awakened suspicions. He wrote a new letter to my wife, even more loquacious than the former ones. Now he asked her pardon for having tried to introduce himself as an acquaintance. He owned that she did not know him, but nevertheless he was a well-wisher. He had to make to her a most important communication. My life was in danger, and he wanted to warn her. The baron and his secretary took an outing in the fields to read together that letter and to consult about its tenor, the forest guard following them at a distance. But they quarrelled about it, and the letter was torn to pieces and thrown in the fields. The forester waited till they were out of sight, gathered the pieces, connected them, and read the letter. In one hour's time the village knew that the baron had never really been acquainted with my wife, the romance which was so sentimentally repeated by the baron's party crumbled to pieces. Ah, then, they are not what they pretended to be, the brigadier de gendarmerie concluded in his turn. Then they must be German spies, and he arrested them. It must be said in his excuse that a German spy had really been at Clairvaux shortly before. In time of war, the vast buildings of the prison might serve as depots for provisions or barracks for the army, and the German general staff was surely interested to know the inner capacity of the prison buildings. A jovial travelling photographer came accordingly to our village, made friends with everyone by photographing them for nothing, and was admitted to photograph not only the inside of the prison yards, but also the dormitories. Having done this, he travelled to some other town on the eastern frontier, 
and was there arrested by the French authorities as a man found in possession of compromising military documents. The brigadier, fresh from the impression of the photographer's visit, jumped to the conclusion that the baron and his secretary were also German spies, and took them in custody to the little town of bar sur aube There they were released next morning, the local paper stating that they were not German spies, but persons commissioned by another more friendly power. Now public opinion turned entirely against the baron and his secretary, who had to live through more adventures. After their release they entered a small village café, and there ventilated their griefs in German in a friendly conversation over a bottle of wine. "'You were stupid. You were a coward,' the would-be interpreter said to the would-be baron. "'If I had been in your place, I would have shot that examining magistrate with this revolver. Let him only repeat that with me. He will have these bullets in his head.' And so on. A commercial traveller who quietly sat in the corner of the room rushed at once to the brigadier to report the conversation which he had overheard. The brigadier made at once an official report, and once more arrested the secretary, a pharmacist from Strasbourg. He was taken before a police court at the same town of bar sur aube and got a full month's imprisonment for menaces uttered against the magistrate in a public place. At last the two adventurers left Clairvaux. These spy adventures ended in a comical way. But how many tragedies, terrible tragedies, we owe to these villains. Precious lives lost, and whole families wrecked, simply to get an easy living for such swindlers. When one thinks of the thousands of spies going about in the world in the pay of all governments, of the traps they lay for all sorts of artless people, of the lives they sometimes bring to a tragical end, and the sorrows they so broadcast, of the vast sums of money thrown away and the maintenance of that army recruited from the scum of society, of the corruption of all sorts which they pour into society at large, nay, even into families, one cannot but be appalled at the immensity of the evil which is thus done. And this army of villains is not only limited to those who play the spy on revolutionists or to the military espionage system, in this country there are papers, especially in the watering towns, whose columns are covered with advertisements of private detective agencies which undertake to collect all sorts of information for divorce suits, to spy upon husbands for their wives and upon wives for their husbands, to penetrate into families and entrap simpletons, and who will undertake anything which may be asked of them for a corresponding sum of money. And while people feel scandalized at the espionage villainies lately revealed in the highest military spheres of France, they do not notice that amongst themselves, perhaps under their very roofs, the same and even worse things are being committed by both the official and private detective agencies. End of Western Europe Chapter 14« Western Europe, Chapter 15, of Memoirs of a Revolutionist, Volume 2, by Peter Kropotkin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Eileen. Demands for our release were continually raised, both in the press and in the Chamber of Deputies, the more so as about the same time that we were condemned, Louis Michel was condemned too, for robbery. Louise Michel, who always gives literally her last shawl or cloak to the woman who is in need of it, and who never could be compelled, during her imprisonment, to have better food, because she always gave her fellow prisoners what was sent to her, was condemned, together with another comrade, Puget, to nine years' imprisonment for highway robbery. That sounded too bad even for the middle-class opportunists. She marched one day at the head of a procession of the unemployed, and, entering a baker's shop, took a few loaves from it and distributed them to the hungry column. This was her robbery. The release of the anarchists thus became a war cry against the government, and in the autumn of 1885 all my comrades save three were set at liberty by a decree of President Crevy. 
Then the outcry on behalf of Louis Michel and myself became still louder. However, Alexander the Third objected to it, and one day the Prime Minister, M. Fresinet, answering an interpolation in the chamber, said that diplomatic difficulties stood in the way of Kropotkin's release. Strange words in the mouth of the Prime Minister of an independent country, but still stranger words have been heard since in connection with that ill-omened alliance of France with Imperial Russia. At last, in the middle of January 1886, both Louis Michel and Puget, as well as the four of us who were still at Clairvaux, were set free. We went to Paris and stayed there for a few weeks with our friend, Elie Recli. A writer of great power in anthropology, who is often mistaken outside France for his younger brother, the geographer, Elysée. A close friendship has united the two brothers from early youth. When the time came for them to enter a university, they went from a small country place in the valley of the Gironde to Strasbourg, making the journey on foot, accompanied as true wandering students by their dog, and when they stayed at some village it was the dog which got his bowl of soup while the two brothers' supper very often consisted of bread only, with a few apples. From Strasbourg the younger brother went to Berlin, where too he was attracted by the lectures of the great Ritter. Later on, in the forties, they were both at Paris. Elie Reclus became a convinced Fourierist, and both saw in the Republic of 1848 the coming of a new era of social evolution. Consequently, after Napoleon III's coup d'état, they both had to leave France and emigrated to England. When the amnesty was voted, and they returned to Paris, Elie edited there a Fourierist cooperative paper which was widely spread among the workers. It is not generally known, but may be interesting to note, that Napoleon III, who played the part of a Caesar, interested, as behoves a Caesar, in the conditions of the working classes, used to send one of his aide-de-camps to the printing office of the paper, each time it was printed, to take to the Tuileries the first sheet issued from the press. He was, later on, even ready to patronize the International Working Men's Association, on the condition that it should put in one of its reports a few words of confidence in the great socialist plans of the Caesar, and he ordered its prosecution when the internationalists refused point-blank to do anything of the sort. When the commune was proclaimed, both brothers heartily joined it, and Elie accepted the post of keeper of the National Library and the Louvre Museum under Veillon. To his foresight and to his hard work that we owe the preservation of the invaluable treasures of human knowledge and art accumulated in these two institutions, Otherwise they would have perished during the bombardment of Paris by the armies of Thiers and the subsequent conflagration. A passionate lover of Greek art, and profoundly acquainted with it, he had had all the most precious statues and vases of the Louvre packed and stored in the caves, while the greatest precautions were taken to protect the building of the National Library from the conflagration which raged around it. His wife, a courageous, worthy companion of the philosopher, followed in the streets by her two little boys, organized in the meantime in her own quarter of the town the feeding of the population which had been reduced to sheer destitution by a second siege. During the final few weeks of its existence, the commune at last realized that a supply of food to the population, which was deprived of the means of earning it for itself, ought to have been the commune's first duty and volunteers organized the relief. It was by mere accident that Elie Reclus, who had kept to his post till the last moment, escaped being shot by the Versailles troops, and a sentence of deportation having been pronounced upon him, for having dared to accept so necessary a service under the commune, he went with his family into exile. Now, on his return to Paris, he had resumed the work of his life, ethnology. What this work is may be judged from a few, very few, chapters of it published in book form under the title of Primitive Folk and The Australians, as well as from the history of the origin of religions, which he now lectures upon at the École des Autitudes at Brussels, a foundation of his brother. 
In the whole of the ethnological literature there are not many works imbued to the same extent with a thorough and sympathetic understanding of the true nature of primitive man. As to his Origin of Religions, which is being published in the review Société Nouvelle and its continuation Humanité Nouvelle, it is, I venture to say, the best work on the subject that has been published, undoubtedly superior to Herbert Spencer's attempt in the same direction, because Herbert Spencer, with all his immense intellect, does not possess that understanding of the artless and simple nature of the primitive man, which Elie possesses to a rare perfection, and to which he has added an extremely wide knowledge of a rather underrated branch of folk psychology, the evolution and transformation of beliefs. It is needless to speak of Elie Reclus's infinite good nature and modesty, or of his superior intelligence and vast knowledge of all subjects relating to humanity. It is all comprehended in his style. With his unbounded modesty, his calm manner and his deep philosophical insight, he is the type of the Greek philosopher of antiquity. In a society less fond of patented tuition and of piecemeal instruction, and more appreciative of the development of wide humanitarian conceptions, he would be surrounded by flocks of pupils, like one of his Greek prototypes. A very animated socialist and anarchist movement was going on at Paris while we stayed there. Louise Michel lectured every night, and aroused the enthusiasm of her audiences, whether they consisted of working men or were made up of middle-class people. Her already great popularity became still greater and spread even amongst the university students, who might hate advanced ideas but worshipped in her the ideal woman, so much so that a riot, caused by someone speaking disrespectfully of Louise Michel in the presence of students, took place one day in a café. The young people took up her defence and made a fearful uproar, smashing all the tables and glasses in the café. I also lectured once on anarchism, before an audience of several thousand people, and left Paris immediately after that lecture, before the government could obey the injunctions of the reactionary and the pro-Russian press, which insisted upon my being expelled from France. From Paris we went to London, where I found once more my two old friends, Stepniak and Tchaikovsky. The socialist movement was in full swing and life in London was no more the dull vegetating existence that it had been for me four years before. We settled in a small cottage at Harrow. We cared little about the furniture of our cottage, a good part of which I made myself with the aid of Tchaikovsky. He had been in the meantime in the United States, and had learned some carpentering. But we rejoiced immensely at having a small plot of heavy Middlesex clay in our garden, my wife and myself went with much enthusiasm into small culture, the admirable results of which I began to realize after having made acquaintance with the writings of Tobo and some Paris Magachier, gardeners, and after our own experiment in the prison garden at Clairvaux. As for my wife, who had typhoid fever soon after we settled at Harrow, the work in the garden during the period of convalescence was more completely restorative for her than a stay at the very best sanatorium. By the end of the summer a heavy stroke fell upon us. We learned that my brother Alexander was no longer alive. During the years that I had been abroad before my imprisonment in France, we had never corresponded with each other. In the eyes of the Russian government, to love a brother who is persecuted for his political opinions is in itself a sin. To maintain relations with him after he has become a refugee is a crime. A subject of the Tsar must hate all the rebels against the supreme ruler's authority, and Alexander was in the clutches of the Russian police. I persistently refused, therefore, to write to him or to any of my relatives. After the Tsar had written on the petition of our sister Helene, let him remain there, there was no hope of a speedy release for my brother. Two years after that, a committee was nominated to settle terms for those who had been exiled to Siberia without judgment for an undetermined time, and my brother got five years. That made seven with the two years he had already been kept there. Then a new committee was nominated under Loris Melikov, 
and added another five years. My brother was thus to be liberated in October 1886. That made twelve years of exile, first in a tiny town of East Siberia, and afterwards at Tomsk. That is in the lowlands of West Siberia, where he had not even the dry and healthy climate of the high prairies farther east. When I was imprisoned at Clairvaux, he wrote to me, and we exchanged a few letters. He wrote that as our letters would be read by the Russian police in Siberia, and by the French prison authorities in France, we might as well write to each other under this double supervision. He spoke of his family life, of his three children whom he characterized admirably well, and of his work. He earnestly advised me to keep a watchful eye upon the development of science in Italy, where excellent and original researches are made, but remain unknown in the scientific world until they have been remanufactured in Germany, and he gave me his opinions about the probable march of political life in Russia. He did not believe in the possibility with us in a near future of constitutional rule on the pattern of the West European parliaments, but he looked forward, and found it quite sufficient for the moment, to the convocation of a sort of deliberative national assembly, Zemsky Sobor, or État Généraux. It would not vote new laws, but would only work out the schemes of laws to which the imperial power and the council of state would give their definitive form and the final sanction. Above all, he wrote to me about his scientific work, he always had a decided leaning towards astronomy, and when we were at St. Petersburg he had published in Russian an excellent summary of all our knowledge of the shooting stars. With his fine critical mind he soon saw the strong or the weak points of different hypotheses, and without sufficient knowledge of mathematics, but endowed with a powerful imagination, he succeeded in grasping the results of the most intricate mathematical researches. Living with his imagination amongst the moving celestial bodies, he realized their complex movements often better than some mathematicians, especially the pure algebraists, realize them, because they often lose sight of the realities of the physical world to see only the formulae and their logical connections. Our St. Petersburg astronomers spoke to me with great appreciation of that work of my brother. Now he undertook to study the structure of the universe, to analyze the data and the hypotheses about the worlds of suns, star clusters, and nebulae in the infinite space, and to disentangle their probable grouping, their life, and the laws of their evolution and decay. The Pulkova astronomer, Gülden, spoke highly of this new work of Alexander, and introduced him by correspondence to Mr. Holden in the United States from whom I had lately the pleasure of hearing, at Washington, an appreciative estimate of my brother's researches. Science is greatly in need, from time to time, of such scientific speculations of a higher standard, made by a scrupulously laborious, critical, and at the same time imaginative mind. But in a small town of Siberia, far away from all the libraries, unable to follow the progress of science, he had only succeeded in embodying in his work the researches which had been made up to the date of his exile. Some capital work had been done since, he knew it, but how could he get access to the necessary books so long as he remained in Siberia? The approach of the term of his liberation did not inspire him with hope either. He knew that he would not be allowed to stay in any of the university towns of Russia or of Western Europe but that his exile to Siberia would be followed by a second exile, perhaps even worse than the first, to some hamlet of eastern Russia. Despair took possession of him. A despair like Faust's takes hold of me at times, he wrote to me. When the time of his liberation was coming, he sent his wife and children to Russia, taking advantage of one of the last steamers before the close of the navigation, and, on a gloomy night, the despair of Faust put an end to his life. A dark cloud hung upon our cottage for many months, until a flash of light pierced it. It came next spring, when a tiny being, a girl who bears my brother's name, came into the world, 
and at whose helpless cry I overheard in my heart quite new chords vibrating. End of Western Europe, Chapter 15《Western Europe》Chapters 16 and 17 of《Memoirs of a Revolutionist》Volume 2 by Peter Kropotkin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Eelin. In 1886, the socialist movement in England was in full swing. Large bodies of workers had openly joined it in all the principal towns, as well as a number of middle-class people, chiefly young, who helped it in different ways. An acute industrial crisis prevailed that year in most trades, and every morning, and often all the day long, I heard groups of workers going about the streets singing, We've got no work to do, or some hymn, and begging for bread. People flocked at night into Trafalgar Square to sleep there in the open air, under the wind and rain, between two newspapers, and one day in February a crowd, after having listened to the speeches of Burns, Hindman, and Champion, rushed into Piccadilly and broke a few windows in the great shops. Far more important, however, than this outbreak of discontent was the spirit that prevailed amongst the poorer portion of the working population in the outskirts of London. It was such that if the leaders of the movement, who were prosecuted for the riots, had received severe sentences, a spirit of hatred and revenge, hitherto unknown in the recent history of the labour movement in England, but the symptoms of which were very well marked in 1886, would have been developed, and would have impressed its stamp upon the subsequent movement for a long time to come. However, the middle classes seem to have realised the danger. Considerable sums of money were immediately subscribed in the West End for the relief of misery in the East End, certainly quite inadequate to relieve a widely spread destitution, but sufficient to show at least good intentions. As to the sentences which were passed upon the prosecuted leaders, they were limited to two and three months' imprisonment. The amount of interest in socialism and all sorts of schemes of reform and reconstruction of society was very great in all layers of society. Beginning with the autumn and throughout the winter, I was asked to lecture over the country, partly on prisons, but mainly on anarchist socialism, and I visited in this way nearly every large town of England and Scotland. As I had, as a rule, accepted the first invitation I received to stay the night after the lecture, it consequently happened that I stayed one night in a rich man's mansion, and the next night in the narrow abode of a working family. Every night I saw considerable numbers of people of all classes, and whether it was in the workers' small parlour, or in the reception rooms of the wealthy, the most animated discussions went on about socialism and anarchism till a late hour of the night, with hope in the workman's home, with apprehension in the mansion, but everywhere with the same earnestness. In the mansions, the main question was to know, what do the socialists want? What do they intend to do? And next, what are the concessions which it is absolutely necessary to make at some given moment in order to avoid serious conflicts? In these conversations I seldom heard the justice of the socialist contention merely denied, or described as sheer nonsense. But I found also a firm conviction that a revolution was impossible in England, that the claims of the mass of the workers had not yet reached the precision nor the extent of the claims of the socialists, and that the workers would be satisfied with much less, so that secondary concessions, amounting to a prospect of a slight increase of well-being or of leisure, would be accepted by the working classes of England as a pledge in the meantime of still more in the future. We are a left-centre country, we live by compromises, I was once told by an old member of Parliament, who had had a wide experience of the life of his mother country. In workmen's dwellings, too, I noticed a difference in the questions which were addressed to me in England to those which I was asked on the continent. General principles, of which the partial applications will be determined by the principles themselves, 
deeply interest the Latin workers. If this or that municipal council votes funds in support of a strike, or organizes the feeding of the children at the schools, no importance is attached to such steps. They are taken as a matter of fact. Of course a hungry child cannot learn, a French worker says, it must be fed. Of course the employer was wrong in forcing the workers to strike. This is all that is said, and no praise is given on account of such minor concessions by the present individualist society to communist principles. The thought of the worker goes beyond the period of such concessions, and he asks whether it is the commune or the unions of workers, or the state which ought to undertake the organization of production, whether free agreement alone will be sufficient to maintain society in working order, and what would be the moral restraint if society parted with its present repressive agencies, whether an elected democratic government would be capable of accomplishing serious changes in the socialist direction, and whether accomplished facts ought not to precede legislation, and so on. In England, it was upon a series of palliative concessions, gradually growing in importance, that the chief weight was laid. But, on the other hand, the impossibility of state administration of industry seemed to have been settled long ago in the workers' minds, and what chiefly interested most of them were matters of constructive realization, as well as how to attain the conditions which would make such a realization possible. Well, Kropotkin, suppose that tomorrow we were to take possession of the docks of our town. What's your idea about how to manage them? I would, for instance, be asked, as soon as we had sat down in a small workman's parlour. Or, we don't like the idea of state management of railways, and the present management by private companies is organized robbery. But suppose the workers owned all the railways. How could the working of them be organized? The lack of general ideas was thus supplemented by a desire of going deeper into the details of the realities. Another feature of the movement in England was the considerable number of middle-class people who gave it their support in different ways, some of them frankly joining it, while others helped it from the outside. In France or in Switzerland, the two parties, the workers and the middle classes, not only stood arrayed against each other, but were sharply separated. So it was, at least, in the years 1876 to 85. When I was in Switzerland, I could say that during my three or four years' stay in the country, I was acquainted with none but workers. I hardly knew more than a couple of middle-class men. In England this would have been impossible. We found quite a number of middle-class men and women who did not hesitate to appear openly, both in London and in the provinces, as helpers in organizing socialist meetings, or in going about during a strike with boxes to collect coppers in the parks. Besides, we saw a movement similar to what we had had in Russia in the early seventies, when our youth rushed to the people though by no means so intense, so full of self-sacrifice, and so utterly devoid of the idea of charity. Here also, in England, a number of people went in all sorts of capacities to live near to the workers, in the slums, in people's palaces, in Toynbee Hall, and the like. It must be said that there was a great deal of enthusiasm at that time. Many probably thought that a social revolution had commenced, like the hero of Morris's comical play, tables turned, who says that the revolution is not simply coming, but has already begun. As always happens, however, with such enthusiasts, when they saw that in England, as everywhere, there was a long, tedious, preparatory uphill work that had to be done, very many of them retired from active propaganda, and now stand outside of it as mere sympathetic onlookers. Western Europe Chapter 17 I took a lively part in this movement, and with a few English comrades we started, in addition to the three socialist papers already in existence, an anarchist communist monthly, Freedom, which continues to live up to the present day. At the same time I resumed my work on anarchism where I had had to interrupt it at the moment of my arrest. The critical part of it was published during my Clairvaux imprisonment by Elisée Reclus, under the title of Parole d'un Révolté. 
Now I began to work out the constructive part of an anarchist communist society, so far as it can now be forecast, in a series of articles published at Paris in La Révolte. Our boy, Le Révolte, prosecuted for anti-militarist propaganda, was compelled to change its title page, and now appeared under a feminine name. Later on, these articles were published in a more elaborate form in a book, La Conquête de Pain. These researches caused me to study more thoroughly certain points of the economic life of our present civilized nations. Most socialists had hitherto said that in our present civilized societies we actually produce much more than is necessary for guaranteeing full well-being to all. It is only the distribution which is defective, and if a social revolution took place, nothing more would be required than for every one to return to his factory or workshop, society taking possession for itself of the surplus value or benefits which now go to the capitalist. I thought, on the contrary, that under the present conditions of private ownership, production itself had taken a wrong turn, so as to neglect, and often to prevent, the production of the very necessaries for life on a sufficient scale. None of these are produced in greater quantities than would be required to secure well-being for all, and the overproduction, so often spoken of, means nothing but that the masses are too poor to buy even what is now considered as necessary for a decent existence. But in all civilized countries the production, both agricultural and industrial, ought to and easily might be immensely increased so as to secure a reign of plenty for all. This brought me to consider the possibilities of modern agriculture, as well as those of an education which would give to everyone the possibility of carrying on at the same time both enjoyable manual work and brain work. I developed these ideas in a series of articles in the 19th century, which are now published as a book under the title of Fields, Factories, and Workshops. Another great question also engrossed my attention. It is known to what conclusions Darwin's formula, the struggle for existence, had been developed by most of his followers, even the most intelligent of them, such as Huxley. There is no infamy in civilized society, or in the relations of the whites towards the so-called lower races, or of the strong towards the weak, which would not have found its excuse in this formula. Already during my stay at Clairvaux, I saw the necessity of completely revising the formula itself of struggle for existence in the animal world, and its applications to human affairs. The attempts which had been made by a few socialists in this direction had not satisfied me, when I found in the lecture of a Russian zoologist, Professor Kessler, a true expression of the law of struggle for life. Mutual aid, he said in that lecture, is as much a law of nature as mutual struggle, but for the progressive evolution of the species the former is far more important than the latter. These few words, confirmed unfortunately by only a couple of illustrations, to which Sievertsov, the zoologist of whom I have spoken in an earlier chapter, added one or two more, contained for me the key of the whole problem. When Huxley published in 1888 his atrocious article, The Struggle for Existence, A Programme, I decided to put in a readable form my objections to his way of understanding the struggle for life, among animals as well as among men, the materials for which I had accumulated during a couple of years. I spoke of it to my friends. However, I found that the comprehension of struggle for life, in the sense of a war cry of woe to the weak, raised to the height of a commandment of nature revealed by science, was so deeply rooted in this country that it had become almost a matter of religion. Two persons only supported me in my revolt against this misinterpretation of the facts of nature. The editor of the 19th century, Mr. James Knowles, with his admirable perspicacity, at once seized the gist of the matter, and with a truly youthful energy encouraged me to take it in hand. The other was H. W. Bates, whom Darwin has truly described in his autobiography as one of the most intelligent men whom he ever met. He was secretary of the Geographical Society, and I knew him. When I spoke to him of my intention, he was delighted with it. 
Yes, most assuredly write it, he said. That is true Darwinism. It is a shame to think of what they have made of Darwin's ideas. Write it, and when you have published it, I will write you a letter in that sense which you may publish. I could not have had better encouragement, and began the work which was published in the nineteenth century under the title of Mutual Aid Among Animals, Among Savages, Among Barbarians, in the Medieval City, and Among Ourselves. Unfortunately, I neglected to submit to Bates the first two articles of this series, Dealing with Animals, which were published during his lifetime. I hope to soon be ready with the second part of the work, Mutual Aid Among Men, but it took me several years before I completed it, and in the meantime Bates was no more among us. The researches which I had to make during these studies in order to acquaint myself with the institutions of the barbarian period and with those of the medieval free cities led me to another important research, the part played in history by the state since its last incarnation in Europe during the last three centuries. And on the other side, the study of the mutual support institutions at different stages of civilization led me to examine the evolutionist basis of the sense of justice and of morality in man. Within the last ten years, the growth of socialism in England has taken a new aspect. Those who judge only by the numbers of socialist and anarchist meetings held in the country, and the audiences attracted by these meetings, are prone to conclude that socialist propaganda is now on the decline and those who judge the progress of it by the numbers of votes that are given to those who claim to represent socialism in Parliament, jump to the conclusion that there is now hardly any socialist propaganda in England. But the depth and the penetration of the socialist ideas can nowhere be judged by the numbers of votes given in favour of those who bring more or less socialism into their electoral programmes. Still less so in England. The fact is, that out of the three directions of socialism which were formulated by Fourier, Saint-Simon, and Robert Owen, it is the latter which prevails in England and Scotland. Consequently, it is not so much by the numbers of meetings or socialist votes that the intensity of the movement must be judged, but by the infiltration of the socialist point of view into the trade unionist, the cooperative, and the so-called municipal socialist movements, as well as the general infiltration of socialist ideas all over the country. Under this aspect, the extent to which the socialist views have penetrated is vast in comparison to what it was in 1886, and I do not hesitate to say that it is simply immense in comparison to what it was in the years 1876 to 82. I may also add that the persevering endeavors of the tiny anarchist groups have contributed to an extent which makes me feel that we have not wasted our time, to spread the ideas of no government, of the rights of the individual, of local action and free agreement, as against those of state almightiness, centralization and discipline, which were dominant twenty years ago. Europe altogether is traversing now a very bad phase of the development of the military spirit, this was an unavoidable consequence of the victory obtained by the German military empire, with its universal military service system, over France in 1871, and it was already then foreseen and foretold by many, in an especially impressive form by Bakunin. But the countercurrent already begins to make itself felt in modern life. As to the way communist ideas, divested of their monastic form, have penetrated in Europe and America. The extent of that penetration has been immense during the twenty-seven years that I have taken an active part in the socialist movement and could observe their growth. When I think of the vague, confused, timid ideas which were expressed by the workers at the first congresses of the International Workingmen's Association, or which were current at Paris during the Commune insurrection, even amongst the most thoughtful of the leaders, and compare them with those which have been arrived at today by an immense number of working men, I must say they seem to me as two entirely different worlds. There is no period in history, with the exception, perhaps, of the period of insurrection in the twelfth and the thirteenth centuries, which led to the birth of the medieval communes, 
during which a similarly deep change had taken place in the current conceptions of society. And now, in my fifty-seventh year, I am even more deeply convinced than I was twenty-five years ago that a chance combination of accidental circumstances may bring about in Europe a revolution far more important and as widely spread as that of 1848, not in the sense of mere fighting between different parties, but in the sense of a deep and rapid social reconstruction, and I am convinced that whatever character such movements may take in different countries, there will be displayed in all of them a far deeper comprehension of the required changes than has ever been displayed within the last six centuries, while the resistance which such movements will meet in the privileged classes will hardly have the character of obtuse obstinacy which made revolutions assume the violent character which they took in times past. To obtain this immense result was well worth the efforts which so many thousands of men and women of all nations and all classes have made within the last thirty years. End of Western Europe, Chapter 17 End of Memoirs of a Revolutionist, Volume 2, by Peter Kropotkin